So a few aspects of what, uh, what Tim discussed uh, just before me, and, um, and especially so the, uh, I, would, I would like to show a kind of tight connection between some aspects of that reaction and something that you all know very well from Newtonian gravity, which is the Gauss's law. Um, and I would like to emphasize that uh, this, this whole thing that I'm going to describe can be a threat for the cosmological tests of modified gravity which might be of interest for, for some people here. Yeah. So, uh, well, Tim gave quite a good introduction about all what back reaction is about that I'd like to summarize in, uh, in one slide. So the, the, what we call the back reaction problem is this whole idea that we, um, that the question of whether the, the, the homogeneous Friedman and Matt Robertson Walker model is a good model to describe the expansion of our universe, and especially its dynamics. So the procedure that we would like to do in cosmologies is to starting from to, to know the time evolution of the real universe. But of course, this is a very hard procedure because the, we have too many degrees of freedom. We're not able to solve the, the, the Einstein field equation for the, the complete universe. So we have to rely on models and simplification and assumptions. So what we do is that we usually spatially average the real universe to get an idealized universe that is modeled by the Friedman, the Red Roberts, and Walker geometry. And then we evolve this idealized universe given, given, uh, using the Friedman equations. The question is, is this ideal, evolved idealized universe the same thing as the uh, smoothing the real universe after time evolution? So in other words, is this thing the same thing as this? So this is the summarizing the back reaction problem. One aspect of this problem is the question of the fluid assumption of the fluid description of matter. Some approaches of back reaction, in particular the one popularized by Thomas Buchert, relies on the fluid description of matter. It's, it is how different is a homogeneous fluid with respect to a homogeneous fluid in terms of time evolution. But there is another aspect of that, which is actually what we call the fluid is just a smoothing a set of particles or collapsed objects that are decoupled from the expansion set of galaxies or clusters of galaxies, for example. So this is the main question that motivates this thought, which is, so does a universe made of point massive collapsed objects, the same thing as, so does it expand like a universe filled by the fluid? So this is uh, the question I'm interested in. So again, uh, the previous talk gave a quick review of the literature, so uh, we can separate some of the previous works into two classes. There are some, some works that tend to show that a discrete universe is the same thing as, as a continuous universe. Uh, then we have, well, the very old Swiss cheese approach proposed by Einstein and Strauss in the 40s, in which you put, you introduce in a, in a top-down way the, some masses inside an otherwise expanding universe. So this, by construction, is a, is a geometry that has the same expansion as the one of the purely Friedman, the Metro, the Walker geometry. You have other things that are, for example, lattice universe, infinite lattice universes. Uh, for example, Julien made a model, uh, an approximate model with that. Uh, well, the speaker of the, of, in the room uh, worked of also on that. So those works seem to, to show that uh, there is no difference between uh, a discrete and a continuous universe. 
In another, well, in a more uh, approximate approach, the, uh, the, the work of uh, Tim and Raj uh, with this post Newtonian uh, way of constructing a universe, an inhomogeneous universe, also shows very, very tiny corrections in terms of the dynamics of the universe. But there are other, uh, other works that are based mostly on finite lattice universes, the one that Tim presented in the first part of his talk, where you can find some correction and quite in principle, important corrections between the dynamics of a discrete and a continuous universe. And I would like to know why we have those two, uh, those two things. It turns out that you can understand this quite simply using Newtonian gravity. So the purpose of this talk is, is the effect of discreteness of the universe small, and if so, why? But for that, I have to start with something which is level first year of university that you all know very well, but well, let's do it because it's, it's important to realize where some equations come from. So I'm going to remind you about homogeneous Newtonian cosmology from a, yeah, from a Newtonian point of view, very conservative, very old fashioned. So how do we derive the Friedman equations in, uh, in Newtonian gravity? So you want to describe the evolution of a homogeneous self-gravitating system that I suppose to be hom yeah, homogeneous uh, well, on, on large scale, it can be finite or infinite. So, and you would like to describe this thing which is expanding. So, because we have an expansion that we put uh, uh, right from the beginning, we know that there should be a velocity field. If I choose an arbitrary origin in my in this fluid, uh, which is homogeneous, there is no, it doesn't depend on the choice of this origin. I can describe the motion of fluid particles everywhere with respect to this origin with a velocity field v. And if you assume homogeneity and isotropy, the, there is only one way to have only one expression for this velocity field, which is uh, the Hubble law. So this is just uh, this is not an, an assumption. This is a, con a consequence of the assumptions of homogeneity and isotropy. isotropy. All right. So because we are doing uh, Newtonian cosmology, we we can actually. Uh, describe what is happening of, uh, this, in this whole uh, system with just one sphere because we have Gauss's law. So the, the thing, if you want to describe the dynamics of the expansion, we can look at just what is the evolution of the radius of a given sphere. So um, to, to do that, oh, I just want to emphasize the fact that this sphere, as you see, uh, I'm following the expansion of this sphere in a way that, uh, that um, sorry, in a way that conserves the mass. So I'm, I'm following the, part, the fluid particles that are expanding. I'm not changing the radius of this sphere arbitrarily. I'm just following the, the motion of the particles. So the mass inside this sphere is constant, and its energy as well. So we keep that in mind, right? And we can then write the, the, conserva the, conserva the conservation of total energy, which is just the sum of a kinetic term and a gravitational term. When I plug this expression into the, the definition of the kinetic energy, I get a term like this that depends on the Hubble constant. And when I calculate the, 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 potential, the gravitational potential energy of this sphere, I get this result here. And as you can see here, if you shuffle a bit the terms, you recover the very well-known uh, uh, Friedman equation, uh, is the constraint part. The K here comes from uh, the total energy. So the, in the Newtonian interpretation, what we call uh, in, the, in uh, relativistic gravitation, relativistic cosmology, spatial curvature, is just related to the total energy of the system. All right, so this is how we can derive the, the, the Friedman equation. But what I would like to emphasize is that, physically speaking, what is happening to this system is just an exchange between kinetic and gravitational energy. As the universe expands, because you have gravitation, you have a kind of leaking of the kinetic energy into the gravitational energy. This is what is going on here. But so this applies actually to any self-gravitating system, not just to the homogeneous system that I described in the previous slide. But in this case, you have to be careful about what is the, the physical meaning of this kinetic energy and this potential energy. Because we are talking just about the expansion dynamics. 
you don't want some forms of energy uh, in your in any kind of system to contaminate those those things. So. When I say that the, exp the, the expansion dynamics is related to an, an, an exchange between kinetic energy and gravitational energy, it's the kinetic energy of expansion and the gravitational energy of expansion. And this will be very important. As an example, just to illustrate what I'm, what I'm saying, when I'm studying the expansion of this system, I care about the, the, the velocity of this galaxy with respect to the origin to, as a contribution to the kinetic energy but not about the rotational energy of this galaxy. And if I'm, uh, in, in terms of gravitational energy, I care about the interaction between this galaxy and this galaxy, but I, I don't care about the interaction between two stars within a galaxy. They do not contribute to the expansion dynamics. All right, so this guided me to, um, well, the comparison between two models. So this is what I'm going to present now. It's some uh, discrete Newtonian cosmology in which we, I will present how uh, these, the discreteness of, uh, of, the, um, of the distribution of matter can have an impact on the expansion dynamics. So let us compare two models. A discrete model with a set of, of point masses that are aligned on the lattice. A finite universe, so I have a number capital M of, uh, of particle, that of mass uh, M. A is the distance between, uh, so it's the size of a, of a cell of the model, so the lattice, the distance between two particles. It's not the scale factor, I'm sorry for the, for the notation, this has nothing to do with scale factor. And so I compare that with a continuous model, which is the same thing, actually the same size, the same mass, but where instead of having mass concentrated in spheres, on points, I had mass completely homogeneously distributed within the cube. All right, these are the two models that we are going to compare and the expansion of which we are going to compare. So let us work the same way as for to the derivation of the, of the Friedman equation in the, in the homogeneous case. So for that, I'm going to, to compare the two, the, the kinetic energy and the gravitational energy of the two models. So let's start with the gravitational energy of the continuous model which is just given by this formula. I can divide this integral into two different contributions. A first contribution in which the two points that are integrated over are belonging to the same cell, so this would be so dx and dx prime, so they belong to the same cell, and the, the terms where x and x prime belong to two different cells. So physically speaking, this represents the self-gravitational energy of a cell, and this represents the gravitational the, the interaction gravitational energy between two different between two different cells. Right, so it's very clear uh, from the uh, Newtonian point of view. Now, I can use this separation to to introduce the the the, the discrete model. First thing to notice is that the gravitational self energy is actually um, well, there is no scale in, in, uh, in gravitation, so you can always write that this thing is proportional to the mass of the square of the mass of the, of the cell divided by its size. It's just very generic scaling law. Good thing, because actually the self gravitational energy of the cell, all the self gravitational energy of the whole system, is just the, the same thing, right? They are the same uh, system, just rescaled. So if you, uh, if you play with those scaling laws, you can actually uh, calculate what is the, the ratio between this thing, which is the gravitational energy of the whole system, and the gravitational energy of one cell, which is just given by uh, this n to the 5 third, n being the number of cells that you have in the model. Very simple so far. Second thing, so yeah, then I can replace uh, the first contribution just by something which is uh, the gravitational energy of this scale. What about this term here, the interaction between two different cells? Well, the thing is that in Newtonian gravity we have Gauss's law. In an in extended way, the Gauss's law, the physical content of the Gauss's law is that two masses, well, whatever their distribution, gravitate essentially the same way as the same mass concentrated in the center. So this is exact just for spherically symmetric distributions. 
but it works quite well actually for any kind of distribution. So I'm going to use this approximation that actually the, the interaction between two different cells is just the same thing as the interaction between two point masses at their center. So, based, so in other words, the, this part of the gravitational energy of the continuous model is just the same thing as the gravitational energy of the, con of the discrete model. And this is the bridge between the two models. Because then I can replace this thing by the energy of the model, and I have a direct relation between the gravitational energy of the discrete model and the one of the continuous model. That. So a scaling like n to the minus two thirds. Just to check that this is not completely wrong, you can, you can actually calculate exactly the, what is that, you know, numerically what is the, uh, the result, and this is what you get. So the evolution of the ratio between the discrete energy of the gravitational energy of the discrete model and of the continuous model as a function of the number of particles. And you see that so the, the red, the, the blue squares are the, are the so numerical calculations, and the line is the n to the minus two thirds um, uh, model. So it works very well. It, should, may, it might remind you some plots that Tim showed. So this is exactly the behavior of almost exactly the behavior that is observed in the relativistic models. All right, so um, now what about the kinetic energy? Uh, I'm not going to do it again, but if you calculate what you find is the same scaling law between the energy of the discrete model and the continuous model. So if we put all that together, what do we get? Well, the total energy of the discrete model, which is the sum as the, those, two, uh, those two terms, is just a rescaling, uh, um, well, it's just proportional to the, the uh, continuous counterpart with this n to the minus 2 thirds, which in terms of cosmology can be interpreted as the, if you have a discrete model, the, the, um, the spatial curvature that you have is actually slightly different from the one that you would have in a continuous model by this factor 1 minus uh, into the two thirds. So you have the same dynamics somehow between a continuous model and a discrete model, well, except from this rescaling of the curvature. Now, how can we understand physically what is going on here? So, start from a universe which is completely fluid, well, or which means where the fundamental particle is an atom, or, uh, or well, you know, it's very, very homogeneous. So the number of particles that are collapsed tends to infinity. As you form structures, the number of particles that are forming your model decrease. So you have bigger and bigger structures that form, so the number of particles decreases. So the energy of the total energy of the model decreases. And then you can say, well, how, how is that possible? You should conserve the energy in your model. So this seems to be a violation of fundamental physics. Actually, this is not what is happening here. Again, rem reminder, what we are hearing about is the energy of expansion. What ha what ha what's happening here is that you have a part, as structures form, you have a part of the energy that leaks into the small, de the small scale degrees of freedom. As galaxies form, they get some potential energy and some kinetic energy that is stolen from the energy of expansion. So this is the physical reason for this, uh, this dependency here. All right, um, so the conclusion that we have of, on this Newtonian uh, analysis is that the formation of bound structures leads to a weakening of spatial curvature with time. It's a kind of back reaction effect. It agrees with the, the, so the results that Tim mentioned before, the fully relativistic things, which, which tends to show that actually even if we relied on, uh, if, so the people who studied that relied on uh, relative, fully relativistic settings, the effect that they get is mostly Newtonian. But, and the effect is very small in practice, because if you take realistic, realistic um, uh, values for n, you have something which is very small. Uh, and it vanishes for an infinite universe because it goes like 1 over n to the 2 thirds, so if n is an infinity, you have no effect. All right, but now a key ingredient for all this study was Gauss's law. The moment when, when I, said, I 
constructed the bridge between the continuous model and the discrete model, you remember. I said this is because the two masses gravitate the same way as is if they were concentrated at two points. But this is a very specific characteristic of Newtonian gravity and to some extent of uh, relativistic gravitation. Actually, yeah, uh, so what about alternative theories of gravity? So, okay, I mean, most of you are familiar with that, so the motivations for alternative theories of gravitation is that, well, for, the, for example, dark matter problem, we would like maybe to explain uh, the dark matter problem with uh, modified gravity. Dark energy problem as well, why not using massive gravity to explain dark energy. Quantum gravity, because we know that, well, we have this problem that uh, we, we don't know how to quantize CGR. Uh, so all that, those are motivations for, for modified gravity. What does it have to do with the rest of my talk? It's because a popular test of the modified theories of gravity is cosmology. And the procedure being quite simple, you take your favorite theory of gravitation, you, s you calculate what, is the, the, what are the predictions for the cosmic expansion, and then you see if it matches, if it, if it, yeah, if it matches observation. And then if it does, well, you accept your, your theory or, or you reject it if it doesn't work. But here, this step, you're using FLRW. So you are assuming that there is no back reaction. You assume that discrete masses gravitate or expand the same way as a continuous model, which might be a problem, right? Because most modified theories of gravity tend to violate Gauss's law. Okay, simple example, it's going to take two minutes. Yukawa gravity, the most, the dumbest uh, idea for, to, to modify gravity. You take the, um, Newton, the, the Poisson equation and you add a mass term. This lambda here being, uh, well, lambda minus 2 being the Gravitan mass term, uh, and lambda representing the, so the Compton wavelength of the potent, so the length over which um, you have. Uh, you have your theory of gravitation that looks like uh, Newtonian gravity, and when you're going further, you have an exponential degree. Right, because when you calculate the potential that is created by a, sin, by a, a point mass, what you get is this term, which is Newtonian gravity, but modified by an exponential term. All right, so uh, then if you, well, look at what is uh, the modification Gauss's law and you integrate the gravitational field around a given, uh, the given uh, the boundary of a given domain, you have the standard term, Gauss term, but you have an extra term that potentially violates Gauss. Right, so this is a good candidate to show that you can have problems with modified gravity. A consequence of that is that two spheres do not uh, have, do not have the same gravitational interaction as two point masses. You have the ratio between this and this is uh, a function of the ratio between the size of the, of the sphere and the uh, Compton wavelength. So contrary, con contrary to the Newtonian case, in the Yukawa case, forming bound structures do not have the same effect of kinetic and gravitational energies. The correction persists even if you have n equal infinity, if you have an infinite universe. And it is equivalent to a renormalization of Newton's, Newton's constant, like this one. This is an effect that goes on the top of the modification of gravity. This is not just the renormalization of the gravitational constant that you had in F of R and things like this. It goes on the top of that. Illustration. If you plot the effective gravitational constant in Yukawa uh, with respect to the true gravitational constant as a function of the ratio between the, the size of the cells in the discrete model and the, the Compton wavelength, well, so if you have very, very small objects, of course, you get a correction which is very small, but you can have corrections of all the unity if you have uh, cells that are on the order or bigger than the Compton wavelength of the, uh, of the gravity. So general conclusion, sorry, I'm late. Um, back reaction is the possible departure of the cosmic expansion dynamics with respect to the prediction of an FLRW model. The back reaction due to the formation of gravitationally collapsed structures is negligible in Newtonian gravitation in GR because of Gauss's law. But this is not true for most modified gravities, the theories of gravity, which in principle, threatens all the trustworthiness of the cosmological test of those theories. And this, I think, is something that must be carried out. 
Thank you very much for your attention. intended to be a, a full cosmological model, right? Yeah. Because we need to try to simplify the, the question as much as possible to understand what could be the causes of, of, of back reaction or not. Yes, but of course, for a more refined thing that could be that could be used to quantify uh, precisely the effect and to make it measurable, yeah, of course, we need things that are much more complicated than that. Put the plot back up because we're changing the, the gravitational forces. Ah. So, um, if, if you're trying to create a modified theory of gravity that was going to be responsible for accelerating expansion, um, am I correct in thinking you'd want the, the Compton wavelength for the Hubble side? Is that right? Just, does, yeah. that, does that mean we'd be at the right hand side of this plot? Sure. So, sure. So, that, exactly. That, so, you think, indeed, if you want to explain dark energy, not dark matter, but dark energy, with, uh, with uh, this uh, modification of gravity, yes, the, we, we, you expect the modification of gravity to be Hubble size. So, uh, the thing you want to compare here, so R is, um, as I said, the, the size of a cell, which corresponds to the size that, um, the, so, the, the biggest collapse structures that we have in our universe, they the size that they must, they should have if they have the density of the homogeneous universe. So for a cluster of galaxies, for example, it should be something like 200 gigaparsecs, something like this. So if you take the mass of the cluster of galaxies, you plug the, uh, the density of the mean, the mean density of the universe, it should take this size. So what is important here is the ratio between this typical scale and the scale of gravitation that you are adding. So in this case, uh, 200 megaparsecs divided by 1 gigaparsec, well, okay. so that's not 10 to the minus 8, that's not uh, 100, 100. That's, that could lead to a small correction. But still, if you want to measure the, the if you want to use um, cosmological tests to measure, say, the, some extra parameters of your, of your theory of gravitation to, at the level of 10 to the minus 2 or something like this, well, this should take, be taken into account. Less one last question. Maybe this is possible. There was another one. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, the side of the particle is fixed. So if we fixing the side of the particle, it costs uh, that actually costs some energy, or if you let that in that it tend the side must also tend. So the part, the particles are not expanding. So the a galaxy is not expanding. So when you try to fix that size, it is fixed. So that that holds something else, or it's same. Oh, if, so if I would let the the, the particles expand, then I would have no effect because this is precisely the fact that those particles are collapsed, virialized objects, that creates the discrepancy, the energy discrepancy between the uh, between the uh, continuous case and uh, the discrete case. Well, for the kinetic energy term, for the uh, not for the gravitational energy. Yes. Uh, well, maybe I was going to ask if, if you have a, a universe where you've got a large hierarchy of scales, so you've got clusters, galaxies, yeah. would you expect this to be cumulative and could that make that? I, I, think, I think it should be cumulative, but the dominant effect would be to the, due to the, according to this reasoning, to the bigger structures. So um, if, you, if you have an integrated thing with just small terms, they will anyway be dominated, I think, by the, by the biggest. Uh, I think this is my intuition. I don't have any proof of that. Okay, there's time to speak up.